Be compliant with your Com medication. Yeah, exercise, diet, uh, follow up with your primary care, strict control on, di on your blood sugars. Check your feet every day. Check your feet every day. Okay. Do you also, would you recommend their, like you said, you said earlier, their hands also, right? Yeah, that would be the hands are not involved as much. Um, diabetics, I said, you know, develop the circulatory and, and nerve disease, uh, but for some reason it, it affects the hands uh, last. Okay. I mean, it doesn't always do that, but people who have more advanced disease, yes, I do see it in the hands. And, and I've actually seen people come in with gangrene to the, the tips of the fingers. They have the same symptoms, weird feelings from the nerve disease as they do in the feet. So it, it's, it's not as common, but it does happen. The thing I want to point out is the feet are the f furthest away from your heart. So they get, they're always going to get the least amount of blood vessels or blood flow, and the blood vessels get very, very small inside the feet. So you may just get a trickle of blood down there, and then all it takes is to stub your toe, and, and then you got an ulcer or, or sore. Feet, pay attention to your feet. Uh -huh. I was going to ask you, why are AMPs performed? Why are? AMPs, amps. Amps. Um, well, people don't understand why we do amps, and it comes down to basically what is going to be the best for this patient. Is the patient going to go into some kind of cardiac uh, um, uh, uh, emergency? Is it worth doing the amp or saving the life? Well, obviously, if 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 uh, it's going to put pressure on the heart, then you got to take take the the infected tissue. Um, Define amps for me. Amps, uh, amputations are the removal of either infected tissue or gangrenous tissue, dead tissue. What steps can be done to prevent this problem? Uh, continued follow-up with your primary care. Uh, somebody that is familiar with, um, you know, feet, wound care, things like that. Uh, that's the best way. And compliance. Compliance. Compliance with sugars, yep. Who Going, is involved in the diabetes team? Uh, I, you know, on, on my side, I always like to keep the primary care doctor involved, of, uh, apprised of what I'm doing. Um, I, you know, when they come in to, me, to my office, I'm, I'm literally, as soon as they walk walking in, I already know what I'm going to do. Uh, the first thing on my mind is checking circulation. Uh, that's, that's most important. If that's, you know, poor, then I'm going to send them cardiovascular. I will follow up with endocrinology. Uh, every now and then. You always want to keep the uh, nephrologists on board as well. Um, I do employ a lot of home health agencies to help me because what home health agencies do for me is they're kind of my eyes and ears when the patient's not around. So patient comes into me with wounds, uh, the patient leaves the office, uh, they're not always compliant. In other words, they don't always want to do what I want them to do. So. I employ a home health agency to go and actually kind of check up on them, see if they've developed any infection, see if there's changes, and then the home health agency calls me and lets me know. So I get a lot of areas on board. Uh, every now and then I'll get dietitian, nutritionist as well. But, um, you know, I see my wound care patients about once a week. We put grafts on, we do whatever we need to. But what the patient does when they leave the office is, a, and it is, is an entirely different story. And, and it's not that I'm trying to uh, control them. I just want them to be uh, safer and make sure that the progress or the improvement of the wound is, is, is proceeding like how I want it. And you talk, touched a little bit about di um, nutrition, uh, your dietitians mm -hmm. um, being involved in how also important is the nutrition for your patients. Is that something that you it's, highly stress to them? It's very important. You know, we live on the borderland with the great food, um, but <laughs> it's not true. it's not great for our circulatory system. Uh, it just it's just full of um, you know fats and you know uh, cholesterol. It's it just it's just not good. And and to a, di a diabetic, that's a double whammy because they already have a disease that's attacking the vessels. You eat bad, and then even if you add smoking onto that, then you know that's just a recipe for a disaster. Give me some factors that make diabetes worse. Um, risk factors, smoking, alcohol, poor glycemic control, uh, sedentary behavior, no exercise, um, genetics, 
familial, non-control. Uh, what I like for my, my primary care docs is I like to see that they have them on some type of cholesterol medicine, and that helps out a lot. They, they've done some studies where they found that uh, cholesterol medicines can actually reduce or, or uh, retard some of the growth of the plaques. Um, the vessels in the leg, like the thigh and the calf, are big, but when it gets down to the top of the foot, they become so small, and so you get a small plaque in there, you're not gonna get blood flow to a toe. That's why when patients do go for an amputation, toes are always always the first to go. And, and it's a shame because the patients see this and then they're like, oh no, what's next? And it seems to just go up and up and up the leg. Um, but if you have uh, a good team, uh, and, and in particular, um, you know, with that is uh, cardiovascular, they can reestablish blood flow, then you have a real good shot of healing these things. How can we eliminate some of the ignorance and misconceptions that there is about diabetes out there? Uh, it, it's hard. Um, I hate to say it, my mom, my mother-in-law, you know, she, she's just old school and she wants to do all these things. I've tried to talk to her about different things. She's a diabetic. Uh, I don't, you know, we just give out as much information as you can. Uh, when I do a lot of lectures, I, I teach community college and I show, I show nasty pictures. I show all the gangrene, I show the amps I've done. Uh, I, I think shock value in some patients. You don't wanna, I try not to go into the room, patients there, and say, oh, you know, that's, it's gotta come off. I, I try not to do that. I try to be more subtle, say, Let, let's give this a shot. Let's try and work uh, all of the adjunctive therapies that we can do, uh, either wound care first, grafting we also use hyperbaric oxygen as well so i try and employ all that and and to me unless it's an active uh, abscess um, certain other diseases like necrotizing fasciitis which is basically flesh-eating bacteria i i like to wait and give wound care a shot before i do my surgeries or amputations statistics diabetes statistics 150,000 amputations a year a year that's pretty high that's nationally uh, when you have an amputation below the knee, you have about three to five years to live after that. That's documented evidence. My own stepfather back in the 90s got uh, the same thing. He lived three years to the day. Once you get that amputation, it places too much burden on the body and the heart, and it, you, you just can't do it. Why is wound care important and, and for the patient and the family to learn the treatment? Uh, it's very important because to me it's the first line of defense. You know, a patient comes in with a wound, um, you're not going to do surgery first. You've you got to establish a rapport with these patients. You've got to build their trust and say, look, this is what we're going to try. Um, you also have to tell them that, you know, there is a possibility of some things that may occur in the future that uh, you may not like, but we're going to give this uh, as much uh, um, attention as we can to get it healed. I want to talk about shoes, uh, okay. footwear. Is that important? Uh, diabetic footbear, footwear is very, very important. Um, I, I dispense diabetic footwear in my office. Um, you, nowadays, diabetic footwear can be get, gotten in the mall. Um, you need to be very, very careful with that. Uh, you don't want some 18-year-old kid given a diabetic uh, pair of shoes when they really don't know what's behind. Uh, a diabetic's problem. You know, this diabetic may come in and ha be missing part of their foot, and they say, oh, this is fine, and then they take the shoes home, uh, and then you have a hot spot, or you have the start of a blister or an ulceration. So you got to be really, really careful um, with that. The, the best, really, the best places are, you know, uh, to see either a podiatrist, an orthotist, or a prosthetist. Those are the three best people to see for a diabetic shoe. How often should um, the circulation be checked on the feet? Um, every time, I have patients come in probably every two months. I check it every time. Uh, however, I do do an exam called an ankle brachial index, and that checks gives me a general idea of how their circulatory status is. That should be checked. Uh, if you are 50 years old and diabetic, that should be checked yearly. If you are 70 years old and do not have diabetics, diabetes, then that should be checked yearly. Uh, let's see, symptoms of neuropathy, diabetes S neuropathy. Okay, symptoms of neuropathy. Think of neuropathy as like 
like a, a cord that is kind of not working. It's short circuiting. So you take a cord and you put a little nick in it and it's not going to work right. So what happens is the nerve just starts misfiring and what you get is you get numbness, burning, tingling. Uh, you may get cramping at night. Uh, you also, sometimes patients complain like they have their, feels like their socks are balled up in their shoes. It just doesn't feel like their feet. Okay. Give me the symptoms again one more time. Just for a okay, so public. numbness, burning, tingling, cramping. Uh, also, funny feelings in the sock like pebbles or the shoes or the socks are balled up. Okay. Thank you. Let's see. The next question is special um, diseases specific to diabetes. Yeah, the, the ones that are specific to diabetes, probably the number one is going to be Charcot. Um, Charcot, is a is rare, Charcot is a rare disease that, it's almost like an autoimmune disease that attacks the diabetic foot. They're not really sure of the cause of it, but what they think is that the nerves inside the foot, since they are not working properly, these diabetics walk around, they beat their feet up all day, and you and I, we, we would say, okay, our feet are tired, let's stop but they don't feel their feet the same way. And even though they, the, my diabetics will come in, they'll say, yeah, I can feel my toes, but when I do a certain test on them and have them close their eyes, they can't even feel anything. So what this does is it causes the vascular flow to increase and it breaks down the foot and that sets them up for ulcerations. Gangrene? Gangrene, very, very, uh, that's almost the biggest thing people come in. Oh, is, you know, they see a little black right away, they're worried about gangrene. Now, there are two types of gangrene. Uh, most of the time I see patients or diabetic patients develop the vascular gangrene, whereby the foot just dies. And so the foot almost becomes like mummified. Uh, the other type of gangrene is, is wet, and that's a medical emergency, which is caused by a bacteria, Clostridium. Um, and that's that's uh, needs to be taken to the emergency right away. And osteomyelitis, that's the bone. Yeah, the osteomyelitis is. Let's say that, you know the patients are walking around for a month. Hey, I've had this ulcer. Well, that ulcer just creates a tunnel for bacteria just to climb in there. And once they get into bone, uh, they love it. That's perfect breeding ground for them. And they just basically, if you take an X-ray, you can actually see the bone disappear. Who is at risk for diabetes? Who's at risk? Uh, family history, um, you know, going back to the uh, genetics, family history, uh, age onset, you know, the longer you live, your diet, your exercise, you will take care of it, you're going to get it. So I'm going to wrap this up, and I just want to know the importance is don't let diabetes take control of you. Yes. You take control of diabetes through compliance, good nutrition, uh -huh. good foot care, examine right. your feet every day. Right. Look for those signs and symptoms and uh, check with your doctor often. And yeah, you need to follow up your primary and at least a podiatrist, somebody that's versed in, in uh, lower extremity care. Dr. Taylor, if they need to get a hold of you, where, do you have a number, an address? That yeah, they can I, call have, you? Uh, I have uh, two offices. I'm also a director at Macy Hills Wound Care. Um, they can get a hold of me either place. My office is on 3917 North Mesa. 3917 North Mesa. Uh, uh, the number is 533 1622. 533 1622. I am one of the few doctors that will actually give my diabetic patients my cell phone number. Well, and so they need to give you a call. If, and, and, if, and if I have a diabetic patient that says they're in trouble, we'll get them in, in within 24 hours. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for being thank you for having to me. benefit the aging. I appreciate Once it. Once again, I want to thank the public for watching us today. If you have any questions about your Medicare hospice benefit or home health, you may contact me or uh, contact me, Joe Rutia or Robert Vasquez at 544-0044. Thank you for watching us on Choices to Benefit the Aging, sponsored by Choice Home Health and Hospice. God bless you. Choices to Benefit the Aging has been brought to you by Choice Home Care and Hospice. For more information on this program, go to El Paso Southwest Senior Magazine at www.southwestsenior.com Furniture provided by Copenhagen, 6550 North Mesa.